So uh, I was tasked with introducing for this uh, really august session, uh, uh, regeneration and stem cell therapies for optic neuropathies. And I will just uh, state the obvious caveat first in the absence of a really powerful and specific animal model, which is one of the goals that uh, Joyce Liao and, and a group of people are now working towards. Um, uh, we've been studying many of the molecular biological approaches to uh, regeneration and cellular therapeutic approaches to optic nerve restoration of function in other animal models, other optic neuropathies, including optic nerve injury, optic nerve trauma, optic nerve stroke, and glaucoma optic neuropathies. Um, and, uh, and obviously it's a pleasure having everyone here and it's really a pleasure for me to get to also thank the, the breadth of fantastic faculty that we have both in the laboratories uh, and in the clinics uh, who help bring together these kinds of larger collaborative projects so effectively. Um, so I'm gonna couch what I'm gonna talk about in the context of the prospects for a human optic nerve regeneration, but start obviously in the laboratory. And I will say that the talks that we have following me in this session are going to also delve into really fantastic detail about uh, some of these prospects going forward. Um, uh, I don't have any relevant financial disclosures and I wanna thank upfront funding from the Bright Focus Foundation, the Glaucoma Research Foundation, the National Eye Institute, the Department of Defense and other sources. Um, so I'm gonna turn the focus really to the retinal ganglion cells and their axons in the optic nerve, which degenerate of course in all of these optic neuropathies. And note of course that the, um, you know, that it's really the, uh, retinal ganglion cell axon degeneration and the failure of regeneration down the optic nerve, as well as the eventual death of the retinal ganglion cells uh, that, um, uh, you, you know, that, that are then not replaced in the disease uh, that, 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 that leads to this permanent vision loss that we have in this and other diseases. And so we have these unmet needs that we've been talking about through that throughout the day. And in particular, the treatments targeting the retinal ganglion cells and optic nerve, we cluster these into a few different terms. One is neuroprotection. That is to say, what kind of treatments might keep retinal ganglion cells alive despite the uh, uh, insult of optic dystrusin or other optic neuropathies? We talk about regeneration or neuroregeneration and that by that, I mean really the uh, regrowth of the axons down the optic nerve to reconnect them to their proper targets in the brain. And then there's also cellular regeneration. In other words, making getting new retinal ganglion cells in there uh, uh, for, to replace the ones that have died. And then neuroenhancement is another term that we've taken from the Alzheimer's disease literature. And that really refers to the um, the uh, uh, giving a booster shot to the sick but not yet dead retinal ganglion cells. And then we've just had a really wonderful session about what I think is another obviously very big unmet need and that's the better biomarkers. So how similar is optic dystrusin optic neuropathy to glaucomatous optic neuropathy? You know, we think that in both of them there's injury first. So for example, in glaucoma, the eye pressure is raised or in optic dystrusin, there's some damage, whether that's physical, molecular or both. Uh, and then there's all sorts of physiologic failures, and we've just been hearing about some of those that we can start to look at and measure in humans. At some point, the axon does get physically damaged in many of these optic neuropathies, perhaps in all of them. And then sometime later, the retinal ganglion cells actually die. And so there's this opportunity to intervene uh, both early when physiologic failures are happening to promote survival and regeneration, uh, as well as late after the retinal ganglion cells die to think about how are we going to replace those. And that's really in those two buckets where we talk about regenerative therapy and, uh, and then later in disease stem cell type therapy. So we've learned a lot in recent years about the signaling that promotes survival and neurite outgrowth. And normally retinal ganglion cells and other neurons in the central nervous system need a combination of signals. They need what are called neurotrophic factors, uh, th acronyms like BDNF and CNTF. Uh, these are proteins expressed by themselves or more typically their neighbors that tell retinal ganglion cells to, to stay alive. And then they often also need a second signal in the form of electrical activity or depolarization. 
And particularly during times of stress or injury, these two signals actually converge. And we've actually discovered with uh, Mike Kapiloff, who will talk about this at another time, um, we've actually discovered uh, some of the signaling uh, scaffolds that bring together these signals. And together during times of stress and injury, uh, uh, work together to promote survival and also neurite growth or axon regeneration of retinal ganglion cells. And targeting both of these pathways, uh, electrical activity and depolarization, for example, Andy Huberman's going to talk about in the context of activity in retinal ganglion cell biology uh, uh, and neuroprotection and regeneration. Uh, and then also neurotrophic signaling. These are proteins that we've now begun to study in human patients, providing these proteins in excess supply to try to promote uh, uh, visual function in people. And I'll talk about that very briefly at the end. We've also begin, begun to discover as a field many of the molecular pathways that regulate the axon regeneration. Here's a picture of a mouse optic nerve that's been physically injured. Uh, and the bright uh, uh, signal you see on the right side of your screen are the axons that have been injured. And they stop and don't go back down the optic nerve. Uh, but if we do certain molecular manipulations of some of the new genes that we've been discovering over the years as a field, uh, we can actually get quite long distance regeneration where normally there would be none. And this is really leading to a lot of excitement in the field that some of these may be sort of gene therapies or molecular therapies that we could translate to human trials to promote long distance regeneration and therefore reconstitution of optic nerve function and restoration of vision. I'm not going to belabor it here, but Andy Huberman's going to talk next about really exciting work that he's been pushing forward on visual stimulation to promote optic nerve regeneration and vision restoration. And uh, so how about then if we are late in the disease and we've lost retinal ganglion cells, well, there we really wanna talk about stem cell therapies. And stem cells can do two things, it turns out. Uh, here's the normal retina diagram of the normal retina with our retinal ganglion cells here diagrammed in, in green. And as we lose retinal ganglion cells in optic drusen or glaucoma or other optic neuropathies, one thing that donor stem cells do is they make a lot of survival factors. And so simply putting them inside the eye may help promote the survival and the function of the ret remaining retinal ganglion cells and slow down or stop the disease. Of course, what we're really interested in for retinal ganglion cell uh, stem cell therapies is the idea of retinal ganglion cell replacement. And that's where we turn stem cells into retinal ganglion cells and then get them to integrate into the retina. And that's really uh, two big significant problems that both really need progress in solving. One is how to turn stem cells into retinal ganglion cells. And the second is how to get those stem cells, stem cell derived retinal ganglion cells to integrate into the retina, both locally where they have to send their little dendrites and collect all the visual information, as well as over a long distance, those replacement retinal ganglion cells also have to grow their axons all the way down the optic nerve and back to the right centers in the brain if they're going to replace function. So we've been attacking this problem by dividing it in two just like this. First, we've been asking, how do we turn stem cells into retinal ganglion cells and what signals regulate ganglion cell fate specification? And here over the last few years, we've discovered a few different pathways that it turns out are converging to control retinal ganglion cell specification. We studied this first in mice uh, where uh, Jonathan Hertz, a student in the lab, and then Kunjur Chang, a postdoc in the lab, uh, discovered a pathway around SOX4 and SOX11. These are transcription factors that are required for retinal ganglion cell differentiation and optic nerve development, axon growth in, into the optic nerve. And if we get rid of these two genes in, um, in the developing mouse, then the retinal ganglion cells almost completely fail to form during development and the optic nerve almost completely fa fails to form during development. So this suggests that these are really important factors for uh, promoting retinal ganglion cell fate from stem cells, from normal stem cells. Kunjur then went on to really study a, a portion of the signaling pathway, up, upstream, signaling pathway upstream of that and discovered a particular protein molecule called GDF15 or growth and differentiation factor 15, 
that very strongly promotes retinal ganglion cell fate specification. Uh, so much so that uh, getting rid of GDF15 really does block uh, ganglion cell uh, cells from forming. And interestingly, providing extra GDF15 signaling does really uh, promote uh, extra ganglion cells to form. And so Kunjers really put this together into a new signaling pathway for retinal ganglion cell fate specification. Normally, stem cells are being prohibited or prevented from forming too many retinal ganglion cells through a signaling pathway that uses a closely related molecule called GDF11. But when GDF15 gets added to the mix, it actually blocks that inhibitory pathway, allowing more ganglion cells to form, and also promotes through that SOX4, SOX11 type pathway, directly promotes retinal ganglion cell differentiation. So this really shows that we can make more ganglion cells in the mouse. Can we do the same thing with human stem cells? Uh, well, Yoni and then Kunjer have been working very hard on that question in the lab as well, and are showing actually that putting the two together, uh, in this case, using human-induced pluripotent stem cells, these are the ones that we can get from skin biopsies, for example, uh, that we can turn those stem cells into uh, retinal ganglion cells that look like retinal ganglion cells, they act electrophysiologically like retinal ganglion cells. Similarly, this GDF15 pathway can promote retinal ganglion cell fate from stem cells in culture, human stem cells in culture. Uh, now we have found, Kunjur has found, however, that these human stem cell derived retinal ganglion cells are immature. They don't express kind of the full maturity of normal retinal ganglion cells. And we don't know whether that's going to be to their advantage or to their disadvantage once we transplant them into the, into the retina and ask how they integrate in there. So coming to that transplant question, the next question, of course, is whether we can transplant retinal ganglion cells into the retina. And there we started making progress a few years ago, again, in a rodent model uh, where Presido Venuga Polana, a grad student at the time, uh, had done a lot of work transplanting retinal ganglion cells here with a green fluorescent protein that allows us to track them into the adult rat retina, where she was able to show that a subset of them do integrate into the retina, extend all their dendrites into the inner plexiform layer, uh, and integrate and collect this information, uh, and, and in fact, uh, a uh, are able to grow their axons down the optic nerve and all the way back to the appropriate centers in the brain. So we're making great preclinical progress identifying candidate therapies for survival and regeneration of retinal ganglion cells and their optic nerve axons, uh, discovering the pathways of RGC differentiation from stem cells through these pathways that I was mentioning. And, and ongoing work in the lab is really working on optimizing that differentiation using two-dimensional and newer, newer techniques, three-dimensional organoid cultures in the lab. And then the transplant experiments, as I mentioned, suggest progress, but lots of important questions that we still want to answer before moving to safe and appropriate human testing, including the integration and electrophysiologic uh, uh, maturation of these cells. So, um, so finally, how do we bring that forward? And just in the last couple of minutes, I'll say that, um, you know, we have a problem in slow diseases like optic distrusion that neuroprotection can take a long time to measure. Uh, but if we can get uh, enhancing people's function, improving visual function, uh, then we may be able to detect that in shorter periods of time and have a more effective time uh, 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 doing clinical trials. And so there we're really aiming for clinical trials that might improve the function of sick but not yet dead retinal ganglion cells. And that allows us to look at primary endpoints in months instead of years and really try to incorporate newer exploratory biomarkers. And so uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of this, but I just want to say that we're actually doing some of these trials right now in glaucoma. One trial testing one of these protein trophic factors called ciliary neurotrophic factor that's a, a trial that we're actually expanding because of based on early preliminary data. And a second trial where we looked at a similar protein factor called nerve growth factor eye drops. And then Andy Huberman, who's speaking next, is going to talk about, um, talk about the electrical activity and visual stimulation, both from the laboratory and clinical trial designs.
So in conclusion, uh, we are certainly finding that neuroprotection, neuroenhancement therapeutic candidates are coming forward through discovery and into translation into clinical trials, and uh, that these candidate therapies can be studied in optic neuropathy patients. And in particular, we're particularly excited because merging therapeutic testing with biomarker exploratory endpoints, we think is gonna allow us to, to cross validate these approaches in our human subjects testing. So I'll stop there, and thanks very much for the attention. Thank Jeff, you. there's a question from Brad Katz. Are there any pluripotent cells in the retina that could be persuaded to differentiate into RGCs? And I think you're talking, but I don't hear you. I don't know if oh. other people aren't hearing you either. Um, I'm not on mute. Somebody might have muted me. Uh, I can hear you well, Len. OK. So the question, the question uh, from Brad Cat is: Are there any pluripotent cell in the retina that could be persuaded to differentiate into retinal ganglion cells? I'm sorry, my, my I think my sound wasn't working for a minute, so I missed if there was a question there. Yeah, the, it the seems question to be is: again. Are there any pluripotent cells in the retina that could be persuaded to differentiate into RGCs? Yes, that's a great question, and actually, um, and I and I know Len knows the answer to that question, but he's 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 no, no, it's Brad, it's with Brad it. Katz. Brad Katz. Oh, Brad uh, asking. asking. Sorry, I missed okay. that. Yeah. So uh, yes, in fact, uh, in uh, in you know so-called lower uh, vertebrates, uh, uh, a pop there are at least two populations of stem cells, uh, both RPE cells that may be able to transdifferentiate in some s situations and also Mueller glial cells in the retina that can also transdifferentiate in some situations and replace the missing cells in an injured or degenerating retina. And there's actually quite a bit of research interest in that right now. Uh, um, Tom Ray and others, uh, Dan Goldman and others, Andy Fisher are discovering some of the molecular pathways that in mammals, including humans, are telling those Mueller glial cells not to transdifferentiate and, re and replace the injured or dying cells. Uh, but by discovering those pathways, the idea that we could block the inhibitory pathways and instead promote those Mueller glia to replace the injured or dying retinal ganglion cells, it's a very exciting area with a lot of research right now. And, and I think very promising, uh, still some years away, obviously from human, moving to humans, but very promising looking data so far. We do have another question uh, from one of our actually residents here. So the question is, do this transcription factor that promote differentiation of stem cell to ganglion help in transdifferentiation in vivo? Yes, uh, we do have evidence for that helping in vivo. Uh, we're interested, we're testing right now that question whether it could help the uh, Mueller glia uh, differentiate into retinal ganglion cells and um, uh, uh, Luciano Custio Grieg and uh, Molly Woodworth, uh, both at Stanford, are actually testing those questions right now in animal models.